Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, members of the Federation Council, members of the State Duma, citizens of Russia. Today's address will focus primarily on domestic issues, on the issues of social and economic development. I would like to pay special attention to the goals I've set in my May decrees which were later implemented in national projects. These goals, these priorities reflect the expectations of our people. Our national projects have people as their foundation to provide better quality of life for future generations. To achieve this, Russia will have to develop dynamically. This is a long-term project, but as we strive to achieve strategic goals, we need to get started today because time flies fast. As I've said repeatedly, we don't have any time to waste. I think we are beyond the period of uh, formulating our goals, discussing things. It is absolutely unacceptable to abandon the goals we've set. Yes, these goals are ambitious, but we should not undercut them. Like I said, these goals are difficult. They will require a lot of effort on our part, but they reflect the speed of changes happening in the world today. We need to make progress constantly, picking up speed. People who prefer to work in traditional way, shirking responsibility, should leave straight away. I keep hearing complaints, this is impossible, this is too ambitious, this won't work. Don't even try to get something done if this is your mindset. You cannot cheat people. People always feel hypocrisy, unfairness. They're not interested in bureaucratic red tape. People care about what has really been done, how this will improve their lives, the lives of their families. We should never repeat the mistakes of the past, waiting for communism to arrive. We need to change this situation, change our lives right now. That's why the government at all levels should work energetically. And the government of the Russian Federation, the cabinet, should set the tone for this kind of work. I'd like to emphasize once again, our development projects are not just federal or agency-based. These are national projects, and we should see practical result, practical results in all the provinces, in all the locations in Russia, because of our many years of efforts because of uh, the results we have achieved together we can we have tremendous resources available to us tremendous financial resources uh, it's not a godsend we did not borrow this money no millions of our people our whole country earned this money and now we need to make use of this money to increase Russia's wealth and improve the quality of life for Russian families. Starting this year, people should see practical improvements in their lives and we'll soon review the first stage of national projects and we'll draw conclusions on the quality of work and results achieved by all the levels of government. Colleagues, now let me talk more specifically about our goals. First and foremost, our Number one goal, to preserve our people, to support families. Our Russia is a multinational country, so uh, respecting older generations and uh, uh, supporting families has always been our foundation. We'll do our best to strengthen family values. This is 
the issue of our future, our whole country, our whole nation, our society, religious entities, political parties, mass media, we all should work on this. Russia is entering a very difficult demographic period because the birth rate has dropped, as you know, and uh, this is for objective reasons because of the huge losses that our country sustained during World War II in the 20th century. 20th century and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But this doesn't mean that we should put up with this situation. No, of course not. We were able to uh, overturn this negative trend when our country was in a very difficult situation and this seemed impossible, yet we were able to do that. And I'm deeply convinced that once again we'll do this at 2024-2020. Three, uh, we should achieve natural growth of Russia's population and we prepared a set of measures to support families. Number one, it's important uh, that families are not risking facing poverty because they have children and uh, we have benefits for the first and the second child. Um, uh, from the federal budget for the first child and uh, uh, there is maternity benefit for the second child. In, it depends on the economic situation in a particular region. It's between 8,000 rubles in Belgorod to 22,000 rubles in Chukotka. On the average, it's over 11,000 rubles per child a month. Currently, families with income at 1.5 minimum wages receive such benefits. It's time for us to take the next step. I suggest that starting January 1st, 2020, uh, we'll bring this figure up to two minimum wages. This will Mm, people want that and we receive such uh, letters at the presidential office. Uh, this will increase the number of families receiving benefits by 50 percent. About 70 percent of the families with the first or second child born will now get this benefit. Second, uh, benefits for children with disabilities is only 5.5 thousand rubles. I su suggest that starting July this year, we bring this benefit up to 10 thousand rubles. I understand, of course, that this is not a lot, but still, this measure will provide additional support for families with children who require special care. Number three, the incomes of Russian families should grow, of course, and this is a serious goal. I will talk later about it in more detail, but we need direct action measures. First, we need to reduce tax burden on such families. And the principle should be very simple. The more children you have, the less taxes you pay. I suggest that we increase tax benefits on property for families with a large number of children and uh, five square meters of living space in um, residential housing should be tax exempt. For example, if you have three children in your family, uh, you should have an additional 15 square meters of your living space being tax exempt. On land ownership, I suggest that uh, 600 square meters should be tax exempt. And uh, so uh, the most popular form of land ownership should be tax exempt for such families. This benefit was included, uh, was provided for retired people and people in pre retirement age. Of course, different regions have their own benefits for families with many children, but now this will be a federal benefit. And I ask provinces to consider additional benefits they can offer families with many children. Four, the government and the central bank should uh, reduce mortgage rates uh, and bring it down to 8 percent. 
Uh, as I said in my May decree, we should offer special support measures for families with children, of course. Starting last year, families with two or more children have a special discounted mortgage interest at 6%, and it's subsidized by the government. Yet only four 0.5 thousand families took advantage of this discounted mortgage rate. The question is why? Because uh, people are not happy with uh, these the terms of this offer. Why? Because when a family makes a decision to buy a home, uh, they, the, the, this is a long-term plan, so they take a loan and then uh, the benefit will run out because the rate is only subsidized for three or five years. I suggest that uh, we offer this benefit for the whole duration of uh, the mortgage. Yes, this will require additional funding, uh, 7.6 billion rubles in 2019, then 21.7, then 30.6 in 2021. But this program will cover 600,000 families, so we should certainly find this money. And we know where to find it. We have this money, so we should use it for such crucial matters. And another direct measure, considering the stability of the macroeconomic situation in Russia and the growth of the incomes, I think it is possible for us to introduce an additional measure for families with three or more children. Uh, we should offer a direct payment from the federal budget uh, in the amount of 450,000 rubles paid to uh, clear the mortgage uh, for such families. And this should be retroactive. We, uh, this should work starting from October uh, 2019, and we should allocate funds for that from this year's budget. Let's see what, how this, if we add this to the maternity benefit fund, which can also be used to cover mortgage uh, that's uh, 900,000 rubles, and in many parts of Russia, this will be a substantial, a substantial part of uh, what housing costs. So, I would like to ask uh, members of the State Duma if we need to make amendments to the federal budget. This will require 26.2 billion rubles this year. Next year, 28.6 billion rubles, and then the year after, 30.1 billion rubles. That's a lot of money, so we need to allocate funds for that, uh, using it for this extremely important matter. Families should be able not only to buy uh, uh, finished housing, but they should also be helped to build their own ha housing on the land that they have. So I ask um, the central bank to offer uh, appropriate instruments because this this area is not covered by mortgage benefits at this point and of course of course uh, the land tax should be fair of course we understand that the market value of a property may change but uh, the amount of tax should not be unpredictable uh, we've limited this growth by 10 percent for a residential property and we should now introduce the same restriction for land plots next today when construction companies uh, commission uh, social infrastructure they have to pay VAT and uh, corporate tax on it we should relieve these companies of this burden and uh, this will stimulate comprehensive development of our uh, urban and rural areas where new uh, developer projects have uh, clinics, schools, <coughs> daycare centers next to them. So families can uh, be happy having children. We've uh, provided enough daycare centers by now, but before 2021, we need to address uh, 
the issue of nurseries, and we should uh, build nurseries for at least 270,000 toddlers. Uh, uh, this year we should build enough daycare centers for 90,000 children. We'll allocate 147 billion rubles from the federal and local budgets to this end. And awaiting uh, lists for daycare centers and schools, tax benefits, all the things that I talked about, all this should happen without any additional application forms, any red tape, any bureaucracy. Before 2020, all the key government services should be offered in a proactive format where a person should just request the service and then the system works automatically after that. I'd like to emphasize something. This uh, family support uh, package is not uh, limited to what I just said. This, these are just the first steps. Considering demographic, demographic difficulties that Russia faces today, we will keep doing this offering more and i ask all of you the federal assembly the government to consider what can be done in this respect colleagues we need to increase longevity life expectancy we need to decrease mortality and in order to do that we have to cut poverty rates more than 40 million people used to be there in two, the year 2000. Right now it's uh, some 19 million, but it's still quite a lot. It's way too much. Uh, there was a situation when we had 15 million people. Right now it's been up 4 million. So we need to focus on fighting poverty. An increasing number of people are struggling. It's not just those that are officially registered as poor. They have to save on medicine, they have to save on food, on clothes, on basic necessities. It's uh, families with a lot of children, families with disabled uh, persons, and uh, lone persons who cannot single mothers, those who cannot find a job, perhaps they lack the necessary skills or perhaps there is just not a job that's good for them. And there are so many factors uh, that have an impact, but poverty uh, pushes the, per the person uh, to the limit. The government needs to help such people to get out of a difficult situation. We do have positive experience in some of the regions, like the Kaluga region, the Ulyanovsk region, the Vologda region, the Nizhny Novgorod region, and some others. Their experience uh, demonstrates that the government can provide the right conditions and social contract could be an efficient solution. So what is it? The government provides a job or training to get new skills or provides financial assistance. It's tens of thousands of rubles for families. They could get a, a plot of land or start their own business. Everyone gets a customized assistance which depends on the particular circumstances and the person that gets that those uh, that those funds they take up a commitment to undergo training to find a job and to provide uh, their families with a sustainable income and this has been a there's been positive experience uh, in the world and for those who uh, really seek to change uh, this social contract can provide such assistance. More than 9 million people could uh, uh, take advantage of this program. It's starting from next year, on condition of uh, co-financing, the government needs uh, to start such programs uh, together with the regions. Families take out loans uh, for different purposes. These are consumer loans. They need to be responsible. We know that. But anything could happen in life. They could lose a job, they could become sick with a severe illness. And it doesn't make sense to uh, 
to put a additional pressure on these people. We need legal guarantees for such people. We need to have the so-called mortgage holidays. We talked about that in Kazan. We need to have uh, some time off for people who have lost their income. They need to keep their. Uh, they need to keep their. A house or their apartment so that they could pay out the mortgage later on. It's not that easy. We need to find a way so that uh, the financial institutions uh, are not uh, and in their interests are not damaged. And the central bank also needs uh, to uh, resolve the situation uh, and put it under control of the situation in the micro crediting institution, micro lending institutions. We need to reach out to every struggling family. We need to sort out their problems. We cannot deny their plea for help because somehow their needs do not fit our formal criteria. We also need to have a painstaking uh, approach to every detail. I'd like to uh, use a negative example. This year we just did the uh, pension a pensions uh, benefits for retirees but if the pension is higher than the minimum wage then some extra funds are not available for that particular retired person so that uh, additional money was not provided to those people and people felt uh, left out people felt fooled. We used to, to add uh, to, we used to add funds from the regional or federal budgets uh, to the pension so that uh, it uh, is the same as the minimum wage. And once it reached officially the minimum wage, we stopped uh, doing those, making those payments. We had to look into the situation and take measures, but we didn't do that. And we have to resolve this issue immediately. Even this year, as early as this year, we need to adjust the pensions above the minimum wage that is set every year. What I mean is that the government should first bring the pension to the minimum wage and following that they need to adjust the uh, pension benefits uh, every year and we have uh, to recalculate the funds that were the pensions that were provided in the first uh, two months of this year and you need to add the money that the people did not receive all those who work in the public sector they need to uh, meet the most stringent uh, professional, cri professional criteria. I know that most of the people do comply with those requirements. So working with people is really a hard job. But if you are there, if you have that commitment, you need to talk to the people. You need to have empathy for the people. You need to know what their life is like. And you should never treat them in a, uh, a, in a haughty manner. You always have to uh, understand uh, what their situation is. And please uh, always remember that. Another important issue is health care. I know that current level of availability seems to be growing on the one hand and that's true however many people still don't feel that they're getting the right level of health care and usually it's the outpatient clinics uh, that are the first touchstone for the people. That's where people have most of the complaints. Sometimes you have a long wait list. You have to go to some to another city, to another town, 
The number of mobile centers, the number of outpatient clinic is growing, but people who don't have access to those centers uh, are still struggling. We need to provide uh, primary health services to every individual wherever they live. In 2019-2020, we need to build, and I hope that will be built, an upgrade, another 1,590 clinics. Uh, some of uh, the regions are uh, implementing a project which is called the so-called Lean Clinics. And I went to visit some of the clinics. It's really a great effort. It cuts the uh, wait list. It's uh, much easier for people with disabilities to access them, for families with children. But they are just exceptions. They are not a rule. We need to make them a rule based on the best regional practices. Uh, instruct the government to approve the high standards for lean clinics. We need to have the rules to to certify them and next year to get the region introduce mechanisms that would motivate uh, both doctors and nurses uh, to improve their skills and in 2021 we need to shift to new standards all of the all the children's hospitals need to, to uh, move to the new standards but it shouldn't be just uh, on the facade people need to feel respect and need to feel care from the government to improve of availability and affordability, we need to improve the outreach capabilities. Pharmacies, doctors, uh, clinics and patients need to be integrating into a single digital platform. The elderly, people with disabilities and families with children should not uh, waste time sitting uh, at the doctor's office just trying to get uh, one uh, slip of paper, one certificate. And definitely we also have a deficit of uh, highly qualified staff. We need to reform our education system, our health institutions, but also need fast action measures. And uh, the village doctor program should not have any age restrictions. Doctors uh, who are aged higher than 50 years should also be able to get a one-off, a one-time benefit. One million for doctors and uh, 500,000 for uh, nurses. The uh, most difficult, uh, complex uh, surgeries are done at federal and also at regional centers. We also need to provide efficient rehabilitation programs. We've never had them, but we need to start from scratch. There's a lot of work outstanding. Let's start with the uh, with at least two world-class uh, children's centers, uh, just like we do it with the prenatal centers. We also need to, to uh, come up with a program to fight cancer. In the next six years, uh, we'll spend uh, at least one trillion rubles on fighting cancer. We need to provide timely, efficient uh, treatment, to introduce uh, new technology that, in most cases, help people. More than 80% uh, of uh, children uh, can be treated uh, positively with those who are struggling with suffering from leukosis. That's uh, a drastic shift from uh, the situation decades ago when the chance of survival is just 20% and uh, 
Only those who went abroad could survive, and those who had the funds, they went there. We need to leverage the potential of our R&D. We worked hard with some of the doctors from other countries. Some of the best doctors came from Germany, and they've stayed here for a long time. So we'll continue working in this area to make a, a, to turn around the situation in cancer treatment. Diagnostics is extremely important. Preventive uh, checkups uh, have been reintroduced. We need to uh, have mandatory checkups for uh, cancer. People need to be able to sign up for a checkup uh, in a remote way. They could be able to do this uh, on the weekend or in the afternoon, uh, in the after hours. Uh, they need to pass those checkups without any procedures. We need to provide new services for people who need long-term care, both in outpatient clinics and in inpatient treatment. We need to customize our medical assistance to the needs of families. We need to, to find a nurse. To, we need to train relatives of that particular patient so that they could take care of that person at home. Volg Volgograd region, the Pskov region, the Ryazan region, the Tula region began pilot projects, uh, and we need to roll out a successful pilot project across the country in the next years. Palliative care is extremely important. Up to 800,000 people, or up to 1 million, as the volunteers told me, need that assistance. I went to a children's hospice in St. Petersburg. I know that MPs passed amendments uh, to the uh, uh, law on palliative care. I urge you to fast track that bill. We need to look at uh, how this law is enforced and then we need to pass the necessary amendments. We need to take into account uh, the opinions of religious organizations, volunteer organizations, charities, doctors, those who have been providing palliative care for a long time, colleagues, our people are more and more concerned about the environment and waste and landfills. That's been a great headache for people. You might have heard it at one of the Q&A sessions uh, with uh, the Russian president. Many landfills uh, ha have a situation when there is an overcapacity. And uh, we, ha we have uh, landfills near residential areas in, in downtown. I think investigators need to look into how licenses and permission was issued uh, for these uh, landfill managers. You cannot just say no to the demands by the people. These are complicated issues, but you also have to be able to resolve complicated issues. Since uh, this year, solid waste uh, is now being treated differently, but you cannot uh, pass it on to consumers. Uh, people need to see what they pay their money for and what is the real change happening in the ground. On the ground. We need to get rid of fly-by-night companies that have no responsibility whatsoever, that just get uh, those uh, windfall revenues uh, piling up uh, waste wherever they can. Surprisingly, a year ago I had to intervene to resolve some of the issues uh, personally. I had to tell the Minister of, the, of uh, Internal Affairs and the Prosecutor's Office. I had to do it myself. And the situation was stalled. And I just had to in, instruct those agencies to um, protect people 
and to make sure that the waste is removed. But these uh, shell companies, uh, they get uh, a lot of revenues, and the popular front needs to secure need to ensure popular control. Inspectors need to, to file complaints and the authorities need to uh, work upon those, to act on those uh, complaints. In the next six years, uh, the municipal authorities need to shut down uh, the many landfills. So we need to increase uh, the, uh, the processing level to 60%. Uh, utility companies, energy companies, transport companies need to move to more sustainable, environmentally safe uh, technology. We need to rely on LNG as a source of uh, fuel. We have uh, more, more uh, LNG than other countries in the world. That would yield results both for the business and would also benefit people. We need to switch to a better technology, to a more stringent uh, environmental standards and uh, the uh, city the residents of mega cities need to, to feel the difference the 12 cities that uh, i referred to uh, earlier these people need to see at least 12 percent decrease in pollutants we need to make sure that the authorities and the companies do not avoid that we need to uh, provide to come up with an action list uh, of the measures that need to be taken and there should be a law on the quotas of emissions i know what uh, it's all about. I know that there are strong, there's a strong lobby to uh, stop that uh, project, to stop that bill. They say they need to keep the jobs, but it cannot go on forever. I'd like to remind you that when making such decisions, we should not be guided by corporate interest. We should not be interested. Uh, we should not be guided by the interest of individuals or individual companies. I would ask the Parliament to pass this bill in the fall session. Environmental problems is what our industry and our science should work on. I encourage everybody, and especially young people, to get involved in this work. We should have good environment to pass on to future generations. We should preserve endangered species. This year we'll launch new national parks in Dagestan, Kami, and Saha, Yakutia, Altai territory, and Chelyabinsk. But I would like to, uh, I'd like you to pay special attention to the borders of these national parks. Uh, there is no proper regulation in some cases, so I would ask the the respective ministry to review this work. We need a bill, special bill for national parks limiting tourism to environment friendly tourism without any damage to forests and environment. Of course, we need to take into account the interests of the people living in those areas, but we need a comprehensive approach. Colleagues, we have a growing number of students from remote areas and rural areas in our universities. According to our studies, uh, our school children perform well in uh, different sciences. Actually, we can see that at different contests and university games, university contests we have. All this um, uh, reflects the improvements in our education system, yet we still do have certain problems. For example, the number of modern schools uh, has increased from 12% in 2000 to 85% in 2018, but we still have about 2,000, uh, 200,000 children attending schools without proper utility services, running water, 
sewers and so on. Yes, this is a relatively small number, yet when parents see that these are the conditions that their children have at their schools, it's useless to talk about equal opportunity. People just get dissatisfied and angry. So uh, I would ask governors of the regions where we still have such schools, we need to do something. I ask you to support the regions that are unable to cope with this problem yet. Next, in 2006, when we started introducing the Internet in schools, uh, technology was very different from where it is today. Back then, it was a break, and it was a breakthrough. It was great uh, to get schools online, but now technology advanced dramatically. So by the end of 2021, all the schools in Russia should have not just direct Internet uh, access, they should have broadband internet. In 2006, when we launched this program, uh, our standard was uh, 128 kilobits per second. Now we need uh, 50 MBs per second. So we need to increase the speed of traffic by uh, 400 uh, tons. Uh, this will provide access to lectures, uh, studying materials, contests. Uh, this will significantly boost opportunities for children. They can have uh, joint online projects with their peers in other parts of Russia and abroad. We need to improve the quality of education. Government standards and programs should reflect our priorities for the national development. And uh, we should include the uh, best textbook in the curriculum. And of course, personnel is really important. I talked about uh, the village doctor program uh, already, but now I suggest that in 2020 we launch a similar program, a village teacher. And, uh, based in, within this program, uh, teachers who move to rural areas will get a benefit of 1 million rubles. We should also strengthen our common space of enlightenment and culture. By 2023, we'll launch cultural centers in Kaliningrad, Kemerovo, Vladivostok, and Sevastopol. These centers will have uh, our leading museums, theaters, and universities for creative professions. There is a demand for cultural life and education, especially in remote parts of Russia. We have a lot of talented, gifted people working there, true enthusiasts. I suggest that we increase support for local cultural initiatives, projects which include ethnographic studies, uh, traditions, preserving the heritage of the ethnic groups living in our country. We should use the presidential grant uh, fund for this purpose. Also, as part of the cultural initiative, we should provide 17 billion rubles to build or rebuild local cultural and community centers in rural areas. And also another 6 billion rubles to support cultural centers in small towns of Russia. Also, I'd like to remind you that healthcare and educational institutions are tax exempt, yet this benefit will expire in 2021. In 2020, I suggest that we extend this benefit and it should also be expanded to cover libraries and museums. This will allow them to save 4 billion rubles annually. This money can be used for development purposes. They can increase wages for their staff. And this will also stimulate private investment in cultural facilities. Uh, I would like to ask the government, uh, the, the governors to pay special attention to wage levels in education, health care, and other areas in the public sector. They should stay on par with the average wages across the economy. This is something I talk about all the time. 
but we also should increase our average wages. We have over 40 million people working in the public sector, military officers and uh, pensioners whose incomes are fixed. They should grow uh, above inflation. I would ask the government to pay special attention to this. Also, we have 7 million people working in uh, the industry, small businesses. Their incomes uh, depend heavily on the economic situation in Russia. So, we need to make sure that we have freedom of enterprise and uh, business environment. Uh, we should have high-paid jobs in new industries and traditional industries. We need economic growth. This is the only way to beat poverty and uh, improve the welfare of our people. This is the key to success. By 2021, uh, Russia's economy should grow above 3% ahead of the global growth. The central bank and the government should uh, bring inflation back to the targeted level. When we made this decision about our reserve funds, using uh, reserve funds for national priority projects, we knew that inflation. this would cause inflation to grow, but now the time has come for us to bring inflation back down, and we can do that. The government and the central bank should bring inflation back to the targeted level and ensure favorable macroeconomic uh, conditions. We have uh, enough money in our reserve funds. I can tell you that for the first time in our history, our reserves fully cover our debt. And our debt is actually quite low. Actually, this covers the government debt and the private debt as well. And this money works. And uh, revenues from uh, the National Welfare Fund uh, uh, go into the budget. So colleagues who used to criticize the government, uh, the Ministry of Finance, where's the money? They said, uh, what do you do with this money? Yes, we will bring this fund up to a certain level and then we'll start using it without destabilizing the macroeconomic situation. This is what we are doing today. So, uh, revenues from uh, this deposit come to the federal budget. So, the revenue in 2018 was 70.5 billion rubles. For us to achieve higher growth rates, we need to address some systemic problems in our economy, and there are four priority areas here. First, uh, we need uh, higher productivity growth based on new technology and digitalization. We need uh, to promote competitive industries. Uh, uh, increasing, uh, uh, helping our non-commodity uh, industries to grow. We need to improve the quality of national economic jurisdiction. We don't want our businesses moving to other jurisdictions. We want our companies to register in Russia. Uh, we need to increase uh, this by 6 to 7 percent by 2020. Uh, this will be the key uh, performance indicator for the government. We need to remove it. Uh, uh, barriers uh, for development, and we need to provide uh, national uh, trained personnel. These are the areas that we'll focus on, and now I would like to cover them in more detail. Uh, we have um, huge demand for high-tech products in Russia, and uh, this is no exaggeration. Uh, let me tell you, this is a historic opportunity for us to achieve fundamental growth for engineering, uh, for the IT industry, for radio electronics, other areas. As part of national projects, we plan to purchase medical equipment, construction equipment, telecommunications equipment, uh, the utility sector equipment, transport. Six worth six trillion rubles, and these resources should work here in Russia. 
Uh, so I asked the government, governors and representatives of private companies I see here in this room, of course, you always want to buy modern equipment and cheaper equipment when, whenever possible. But I would ask you, whenever possible, to purchase equipment from Russian companies, even work with Russian companies. Of course, we do need competition. This should be a competitive, but we have instruments for supporting domestic manufacturers. We should use them. Uh, everybody should have equal access to procurement programs, especially Russian companies, of course. Those who work hard, those who are diligent, those who introduce modern technology, those who increase productivity, who offer the best products, should take priority. As far as the defense industry is concerned, we should use the opportunity we have today to diversify and increase production of uh, civilian products. You know what I'm talking about. We have a timeline, we have our goals, so we should do our best to achieve that. And this is the time for developing new products and services. Uh, the current wave of technological developments enable us to conquer new markets very fast, and we have examples of a successful, innovative companies, but we need more such companies, including the areas of artificial intelligence, big data, the Internet of Things and robotics. I ask the government to provide necessary conditions for private investors and technological startups and um, de development institutions should support this effort. And I ask the parliament to pass the bills required for shaping the environment for the new digital economy by using digital technology for progress, developing e-commerce and digital trade. We need a legislation that would be in line with this new reality. These laws should not restrict our development, should not restrict uh, advanced technologies. On the contrary, they should help. Another important indicator is exp expanding our exports, uh, developing external markets. The agricultural industry is a very good example of that. In 2018, we achieved growth of 19.4% on exports, that's uh, $25.8 billion. Even in the next couple of years, we should get to $45 billion. We are not just one of the major wheat exporters. Last year, we exported 44 million tons of wheat. And we also have another significant achievement, at least one. Uh, because of Russian scientists, we are now fully independent as far as wheat seeds are concerned. And this is critically important, specialists know. Russia should have its own uh, agricultural technology, and it should be available not only to major companies, but also to small businesses. This is a national security issue. This will make us competitive on the growing agricultural markets. Another key factor for agriculture is improving the quality of life in rural areas. And I would ask the government, this year we need to adopt a new program for developing rural areas. It should start working in, on January 1st, 2020. <coughs> and one more point. Uh, this is our natural advantage. I think you will all agree with that. Uh, is uh, natural resources available to us. We should use this to develop green production, green products. And I would ask the government to set up a new brand of green products, uh, a national brand. This would mean that only uh, safe technology is used to produce these foods and products. And this would be the seal of quality on uh, domestic market and international markets as well. And I assure you, these products will be extremely popular on international markets because they don't have anything natural left in other countries. In order to achieve success, we need to uh, get rid of anything that restricts uh, the entrepreneurial spirit uh, of uh, our businessmen. They should not feel boxed in, they should not feel the uh, pressure of uh, administrative or criminal persecution. I 
earlier I shared some of the figures. Uh, I talked about that. The situation has not really changed. 45% of uh, the cases uh, that uh, they uh, collapsed before even the court, uh, before the court proceedings start. It means that uh, the case was opened uh, on uh, trumped up charges. What it means in practice, if uh, you uh, damage uh, someone's business, on average, 130 people lose uh, their jobs. And this is a big issue for the economy. The business community uh, points uh, to uh, many issues in enforcement uh, and uh, in our legal framework. And uh, there are instances when uh, people who work in the same company can be charged uh, as a criminal group, and that might entail a uh, stronger punishment. This is absurd. The so-called economic crimes have to be uh, uh, have to be uh, treated in a fair way. Very often, people are kept in jail simply because investigators uh, are not competent enough or do not have the time uh, to uh, do all the necessary procedures. People sit in jail or in detention. And in several months, for several months, they've been sitting there and they've not had any questioning. And the investigators could be just on a holiday. I know that they have a lot of workload and something has to be done with it. Perhaps we need to hire more people to increase the number of investigators, but it can't happen. It can't happen that people are in jail for some time. They have not been questioned, and the investigator is on vacation. I would like to instruct the prosecutors' office to answer the in our uh, Ministry of Interior to look into the issue and to come up with the proposals. The uh, Strategic uh, Initiatives Agency needs to come up with a digital platform. Actually, that's been their initiative. Entrepreneurs would be able to make, uh, to voice uh, their concerns, uh, to officially inform the public that they are under pressure, and to uh, get out a plea to the authorities so that uh, the leadership of the uh, investigative authorities would take action. The government needs to work together with the business community to uh, draft the right legislation and come up with the right le digital platform to launch that platform. The investigative committee is the, and the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the prosecutor's office need to come up with the right uh, procedures and criteria. We need to have such a platform online, at least in pilot mode, very soon. The government uh, would like uh, to uh, revise the uh, legal framework uh, for in inspections. Uh, I would like to endorse that initiative, but I think we need to take it a step further. We need to take drastic action. And uh, starting from January the 1st, 2021, we need to stop all current laws concerning inspections and regional instructions, regional orders. We just have two years ahead of us. We need to sit together within business community and renew this uh, legal framework. We need to keep only those uh, laws that uh, are that meet uh, current requirements. The rest of the legislation needs to be archived. We talked to some of the colleagues and some of them said sincerely, well, it, it's terrible, you know, that there are issues and they are just horrified to look into it. You might have uh, huge piles of paper that have been, been accumulated since Soviet times. Even further than that, since imperial times. 
uh, well, since uh, the Crimean was integrated into the uh, into Russia, well, I don't mean 2014. I mean earlier times when Crimea was first integrated into Russia. So there's so much paper, so much uh, legal acts that exist, uh, and I don't think that even the stuff knows uh, how many laws there are. So we need to update everything and we only need to have those laws that meet current demands. Based on new technology, we need to upgrade our infrastructure. It will help to uh, keep the country connected. It's important for Russia, the country with the biggest territory in the world. It's critically important uh, to uh, preserve uh, the framework of the uh, country, to grow the economy. This year we'll have, we'll launch uh, rail uh, transits uh, along the uh, Crimea, the Krimsky Bridge. I'd like to thank the rail workers and the construction workers. We now have the access road that's uh, has been launched uh, in the Krasnodar region. This year we'll, we will have uh, finally rail traffic uh, that will have to develop Crimea and the Krasnodar region. We we'll also have Moscow-St. Petersburg a road that uh, will be fully operational. That would create jobs that would uh, provide more opportunities for the business community. As I said, new jobs in the Pskov, Leningrad uh, and Moscow region and the Tver region too. More than 60 airports will be upgraded. Uh, we're also building airports in uh, the city of Khabarovsk, uh, in Yuzhno uh, Sakhalinsk, in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky. We'll increase uh, the uh, capacity of the Trans-Siberian uh, Railroad uh, and uh, the uh, Baikal-Amur main line uh, to 210 million tons. As I said, all the Russian regions need to increase uh, life expectancy and other socially important uh, indicators. This is our strategic priority. Siberia and the Far East, they have to be in the focus of our attention. We'll discuss that when we meet in September at the Eastern Economic Forum in, in Vladivostok. Our plans to upgrade seaports, uh, airports, uh, and roads need to benefit uh, the regions and to increase their investment appeal, tourist appeal. P people have so much interest uh, in our uh, sites. We need to use uh, e-visas uh, for foreign tourists. We have had very positive experience uh, during 2018 uh, FIFA World Cup. We need to focus on the development of the digital economy, telecom, storage, uh, and uh, the data analysis uh, infrastructure has to be increased. We need to provide uh, broadband internet uh, and introduce 5G to revolutionize the communications, to uh, establish, uh, we need to, need to establish uh, a, our satellites uh, in space uh, for remote sensing and uh, new navigation systems. We need to uh, establish the National Space Center. It will work with uh, R&D institutions uh, and act as a unifying force. They will help to train uh, staff uh, and to uh, coordinate research. We see that global competition is getting increasingly tight uh, in education and high tech. 
Few could have imagined that Russia would be able to uh, make a breakthrough in the defense sector on in the uh, high-tech sector. We had to, to start from scratch. We had to come up with uh, brave, uh, disruptive solutions. Our engineers, our workers, our scientists have come, with the, have come up with such solutions, uh, including young uh, scientists uh, and engineers. The hypersonic avant-garde missile is uh, roughly the same in, uh, in, in terms of its impact as the launch of the first Sputnik, the first satellite. It will help to bolster the uh, capabilities of our R&D. At a certain point, uh, the, we got the atomic uh, bomb thanks uh, to our uh, scientists. Uh, and then we were able to set up the missile shield and to help that project helped to launch satellites into space. We got new materials and new technologies. And now that we've come up with new weapons, we need to leverage that potential and use that, those technologies for civilian purposes. We signed a law on genetic research. We have a, we'll also have the same level of program in AI. In the mid-2020s, we need to uh, become one of the leaders of the world. This is the technology that will define the future of Russia and the future of the entire world. To accelerate those projects, we need to have uh, advanced uh, scientific infrastructure in place. We had uh, a, we installed uh, the uh, peak reactor of the mega science class. It will be a source of neutrons in the world. It will help to, to conduct uh, advanced uh, research in biology, biology, chemistry. It will help to bring a new uh, medicine to the market. For the first time in decades, the Russian shipyards uh, will start building R&D ships and vessels, including uh, they will be able to study the um, they will be able to study offshore uh, areas uh, to work in the Arctic and in the Arctic. We need to come up with a new model of uh, research. This is why we create uh, R&D centers uh, in Russian regions. They will integrate all the levels of education. They will leverage uh, the capabilities of the business community and the science community. Fifteen re Russian regions need to build those centers. The first five centers will be built this year, three in the Tumen region, in the Belgorod region, and in the Perm region, and they're almost operational. This year they will be launched. We need specialists who are ready to work at uh, cutting-edge uh, technology, at cutting-edge facilities. We need to introduce new curricula at every level of professional education, vocational education. We need to train specialists for the industries that are just emerging. In late August, Russia will, to will host the World's Skills uh, Contest. Let's wish our team, Team Russia, success. This is so important to boost the reputation of those who work in the vocational areas. Based on the experience of world skills, we need to speed up the modernization of vocational training. We need to we need to provide uh, state-of-the-art uh, equipment for 2,000 workshops uh, at uh, Russia vocational centers. We need to, to build quantor, the so-called innovative centers, uh, humanities centers. will create about a million new jobs uh, in vocational training. It will have to be available to all children. The, the Sirius Center in Sachi is a 
jewel in the crown. We hope that we'll have similar centers in all Russian regions uh, by 2024, but our, we're getting uh, we're getting reports that uh, it could be done earlier. We could only welcome such uh, fast-track approach. I hope that our companies and the business community will assist such projects as the ticket f for the future. Students uh, starting from sixth grade uh, could uh, get uh, internships uh, at uh, companies, uh, scientific centers. And again, I call on the younger generation, your talent, your creative uh, uh, but your creative uh, potential are the strength of Russia. We have a network of projects and contests for your personal development. That's the Praktoria project, my first business, I'm professional, leaders of Russia, to name a few. And again, I urge uh, the younger generation to leverage those opportunities. Uh, you need to be brave. You need to uh, benefit uh, yourself, uh, your family, and your country. Colleagues, Russia has been and will continue to be a sovereign and independent state. This is uh, Either Russia will be like that, or it will no longer exist. We, we have to be clear about it. This is no negotiable. Russia can only exist as a state if it's sovereign. Other countries can, but Russia will never be. If you want to build a relationship with us, it means that you should not lecture us or dictate your own conditions. You need to work together with us. We need to build trust. We need to fight common threats. We need to expand cooperation in the trades, in the economy, culture and science. We need to remove barriers for human contacts. That's uh, the platform that we rely on as we work at the UN, the CIS, the G20, BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We feel it is right to deepen our cooperation as part of the Union States with Belarus. We work closely with in the economy, in politics, in foreign policy. As part of the Eurasian Economic Union, we'll continue to expand to uh, more markets. Uh, we also work uh, together to align the Eurasian Economic Union with uh, the uh, One Belt, uh, One Road Initiative uh, by China. And it helps uh, to stabilize the uh, situation in uh, Eurasia. It's uh, an illustrative example, a role model for how we can cooperate in the economy. We also work hard to improve uh, on our strategic privileged partnership with India, who we'll continue to expand our ties, uh, economic cooperation with Japan. We are ready to work mutually acceptable conditions uh, to sign the peace uh, treaty. We are ready to uh, foster better cooperation with the Association of Southeastern Asia, ASEAN as it's known. We hope that uh, the European Union will take uh, action to restore normal economic and political trade ties with Russia. The citizens of the EU are interested in such cooperation. It will benefit them, including uh, medium-sized and big uh, cooperations. Uh, overall, the business community of the EU, and that would uh, benefit our in shared interests. One of the key concerns in the Russian-US uh, ties is the unilateral withdrawal by the US from the INF Treaty. And I am forced, I have to speak uh, about that uh, in greater detail. 
It was signed in 1987, and there have been drastic changes around the world. Many countries have developed and continue to develop uh, this type of uh, armament, but Russia and the U.S. have stopped. We put uh, restrictions on ourselves voluntarily. Such status could raise uh, questions. Well, the U.S. partners had to be honest and straightforward with us. They should not have used uh, trumped-up accusations and allegations uh, to uh, unilaterally withdraw with it. Like they did it in 2002, they did it in an honest way. They pulled out uh, of uh, the ABM treaty. I felt it was done in the wrong way, but at least they did it in a straightforward manner. And they had to do it in the same way here. So how do they do it? They violate everything and then find an excuse and then they point a finger to a scapegoat. And they also use uh, their satellites, as they're known, satellite countries, and they uh, tow their lines, tow the U.S. line. First, they've started to develop uh, the so-called uh, medium-range, intermediate-range missiles. They said, okay, these are target missiles. Then they've uh, started to insolve uh, MK-41 systems uh, in Europe that will be able to carry Tomahawk missiles. Again, these are the violations. They did that. They ignored uh, all of the provisions uh, of uh, the INF Treaty. Now, according to Article 4, Section 1, I quote, each country can liquidate their intermediate range systems and launch systems so that no country could have such missiles and such launches. In Article 6, uh, six Close one. Going forward, none of the country can produce intermediate range systems, does not test such systems, uh, does not build uh, any uh, stages uh, for this, and no launches for such missiles. Now, once you launch intermediate range uh, target missiles and placing launches in Romania and Poland for uh, cruise missiles of uh, Tomahawk style, the U.S. has violated these provisions. They've done it a long time. They did it a long time ago. So they have these launch systems uh, in uh, Romania, and nothing has happened. Well, there's nothing strange for us, but people need to see that and understand it. So what's our assessment of the situation? I said it earlier, and I would like to repeat that. Russia does not have any intention, and I emphasize this once again, Russia does not have an intention to place such uh, missiles in Europe. Russia does not want to be the first in placing those missiles, but if such missiles uh, are produced and supplied to be installed in Europe, and the U.S. Do have, does have such plans, this will definitely uh, create a new spiral in the uh, in the security system, because uh, the time to fly to Moscow could be between 10 to 12 minutes, and that's a serious threat for Russia. We will be forced, again, I, we, have, we will be forced to take appropriate uh, reciprocal measures. And I would like to be open about it. I'll tell what, you what we're going to do today so that no one would blame us later on. Russia would have to build and deploy systems that could be used not against the territories from where we will see direct threat, but also against those territories where you have decision makers on the use of those uh, missiles. Here's an important point, and uh, we'll have a lot of new information here. The flight time for such missiles will be comparable to the threats we see coming against Russia. We know how we can do this, and we will implement these plans immediately as soon as we see such threats becoming real. I don't think that the international situation today 
I don't think that the international situation we have today requires uh, further escalation immediately. This is not what we want. And I would like to add something. The United States once sought global domination um, through uh, global missile defense program. They should abandon their illu uh, these illusions. We will always come up with an appropriate response. Our new weapon systems I mentioned in my State of the Nation address last year, this work continues consistently. We've launched uh, the manufacturing of the uh, Vanguard uh, system. This year it will be supplied to the first regiment of the strategic missile forces. We are also continuing to test the Sarmat heavy missile, Peresvet and uh, hypersonic missiles. Kinjal are being tested on combat duty and uh, our uh, personnel have gained some experience of using this system soon. Peresvet will be commissioned and uh, will be put on combat duty. We'll continue working on the MiG-31 fighter jets ex equipped with uh, Kinjal missiles. We are also testing Burivesnik and uh, our uh, Posidon unmanned uh, subsurface vehicle with unlimited range. And uh, one more point. This spring, we will launch our first nuclear submarine carrying this unmanned subsurface vehicle. Also, I uh, will make another official announcement today about a new system. Remember last time I said uh, there were certain things that it was too early to mention uh, back then, but now the time has come for me to announce another new project. We've been working on this successfully, and when the time is right, we will complete this work. This is a hypersonic uh, missile called uh, Zircon. Uh, the it has the speed of Mach 9. It has the range of 1,000 uh, kilometers and can hit uh, a Navy and the land targets. Can be launched from a ship or a submarine. Uh, and it can work together with the caliber system, so it will not be too costly for Russia. Uh, to protect our national interests, for the next two or three years, uh, ha two or three years ahead of the government procurement program, the Navy will receive seven new submarines, and soon we'll start building five more uh, major Navy ships, and another five uh, new ships will be built before. 2027. To finish the subject of the INF Treaty and the U.S. withdrawal from this treaty, I would like to say another thing. The U.S. policy on Russia in recent years can hardly be described as friendly. The legitimate interests of Russia are being ignored. We see all sorts of anti-Russian initiatives, and this is totally uncalled for. We see new sanctions imposed on Russia time and again. We see uh, unilateral efforts to dismantle the existing system of international security treaties, and at the same time they call Russia the biggest threat to the United States. This is wrong. This is not true. Russia wants to have equal and um, equal relations with the United States. Russia doesn't threaten anybody. Whenever we do anything, it's we do this in response. So we are defending ourselves in all those situations. We do not see confrontation. We don't want confrontation, especially with a global power like the United States. But it seems that uh, the United States does not notice how the world is changing today and where the world is going today. The United States continues with its uh, uh, inconstructive policies. This is not in the U.S. best interest, but it's not up to us to decide. We 
see that these are very capable people. However, among the ruling class in the United States, you have a large number of people who only care about their exceptionalism and their superiority over everybody else in the world. It's their right, of course, to think whatever they want to think, but they should be able to count at least. I do believe they know how to count, so let them count the range of our future missile uh, weapon systems. Let them count first, and then based on that, they should make their decisions that would create additional threats to our country. And of course, whatever they do, will Russia will respond to that. Russia will always secu uh, make sure that it is secure, absolutely secure. Uh, I've said this before and I would like to repeat, we are ready for further talks on arms control, but we are not going to keep knocking on the door that's locked. We will wait for our partners to come to the realization that this kind of dialogue is necessary. We'll continue building our military, we will improve the quality of combat training, use relying on the experience we gained in Syria, and basically all the commanders of major land units, uh, special operations units, military police, auxiliary units have received such experience. Air Force uh, commanders for long term development of our military, for long term development of our country, we need peace. And whatever we do in the military area is only to make sure our country and our people are secure. So nobody would even consider attacking Russia or trying using force to put pressure on our country. Colleagues, uh, we have uh, ambitious goals ahead of us and we work consistently to achieve them. We are working on our social and economic development to provide all the necessary conditions for self-fulfillment so that we respond to the rising challenges of the world today. We need to preserve Russia as a civilization based on its national identity, on our long-standing traditions, the culture of our peoples, our legacy. And the only way to achieve these goals is by working together. We need um, solidarity. We need to consolidate our society. All the people of Russia should strive together to achieve practical results. This kind of uh, mindset is a choice that people make themselves when they realize that their nation's development depends on them, on their labor, on what they do. Uh, this desire to be useful to your country should be uh, supported and welcomed. Everybody should uh, have uh, their work and uh, should be encouraged to work together with others. There should be room for innovation and development. And this cannot be expressed in numbers, yet this is exactly what consolidates society, gets all the people engaged in this work. This will determine our success, and we will certainly achieve this success. Thank you.
Спасибо. Удачи. Thank you.